Welcome in everyone. This is Brian Smith with another edition of the Daily Night. And today is keys to victory for UCF as they host the East Carolina Pirates. Have a lot of stats around me, a lot of different things going on, but most importantly, just watching film. There are a few key things that East Carolina does well, as well as a few things they do very poorly. I'm going to break down a few of those, some of the things that Mikey King can do to take advantage, as well as the UCF defense. But first, I'm going to start with this. Any game plan, does not matter what level of football it is, you have to have one thing for sure, and that's solid special teams. Last week was a disaster, Gus Malzahn's own words. This week cannot be the same. Just stating it for the record, you cannot have that again. Right now, as it stands heading into this next game for the Knights, East Carolina is positive five when it comes to turnovers. UCF is just flatlined, zero. Not as many on one side or the other. UCF needs to find a way to get away from that stat. They need to be in the positive, number one. And number two, if you do that in conjunction with the turnovers and special teams, both being on your side, being at home in the bounce house, it should bode well for UCF against East Carolina. Now on to the main points of this game. There are a couple of things that in particular – that really stood out to me. And as I'm kind of just kind of going over my notes, I wrote about this on Tuesday in the afternoon, Tuesday thoughts, check it out because this is something you can look it up on YouTube, whatever you want. It only take a few minutes. There's some highlights of the game when they played South Carolina. I highly recommend you watch the South Carolina highlights. If you're going to watch this team play and here's why South Carolina is not a very good sec team, but they're still an sec team. They would smack a lot of teams at the non-Power 5 level, and they would smack a lot of teams at the Power 5 level in other conferences. Their defense is very talented. They've got a kid named Birch. It's a 6'6", 270-pound outside linebacker, and I'm not kidding. He's that freakish. Those kinds of guys caused East Carolina a lot of problems. They had five sacks against East Carolina. They closed the pocket. I'll define that further in a moment. But most importantly, when they came in, Holton Aylers did not do a good job when he had both sides and he couldn't go right or left. He does not like to go forward. He does not want to come in contact with the 300 pound guys that South Carolina had much like Kalia Davis, Montalvo and Cam good. The list goes on and on for UCF. They got some big dudes too. He will look to escape to his right or left. Now he's a left-handed player. He's going to look to go left first if possible. It's a little bit different. It's almost like if you're in baseball and you're hitting against the lefty and it's the first time you've done it, it's different. It's different for teams when they play against Dylan Gabriel and the Knights. UCF has to be able to pin him in. This is not easy because that means both sides need to have a pretty consistent pass rush. That's A, but B, you also have to physically make him feel uncomfortable. Not just like I think I'm going to get hit. He needs to feel pain. The quarterback must go down. I, I talk about it every week, and UCF is not doing a good job. They have two sacks in four games, both by Josh Seliscar. Good for him. He's coming on, and I like him a lot. But the other defensive linemen, they've got to do more because right now the, the best defensive lineman UCF has is Kalia Davis. Let's start with that. But he gets a lot of double teams because, A, he plays inside, and, B, he's their best player. It is extremely hard under the current circumstances for him to get to the quarterback. He's got to go through – just an incredible amount of trash, meaning players around him, bodies, to get to the Q QB. You have to find a way to overcome that to a certain degree, but the number one way you do it is have other teammates around you that consistently, consistently get to the quarterback. Make him throw it away, make him make poor decisions, make him move his feet, have an error, and again, I'll go over it in a second, but the article on Tuesday really defines the situation best. He is not good when he's pressured. South Carolina's front did a really nice job. They had a few good blitz packages. And I could actually pull up the stats from that game. That's a good idea. But looking at the game overall, the one thing about East Carolina, when they throw the football and he has a quote-unquote clean pocket, well, Naylor is a pretty good quarterback. He really is. But when you break down the game log and look at him, here's, here's something a little, little bit concerning. Against South Carolina, he was only 12 of 25, 
48 percent 152 yards only 6.1 yards per attempt that's very low one touchdown two interceptions two now here are the two interceptions again i wrote about it in tuesday's thoughts but this is the definition of how you win a game against just about any quarterback but especially a college quarterback this guy's a borderline nfl player he might make a roster for a couple of years very accurate lefty and all that when he can step into his throws. But here's the thing. In the first half, East Carolina ran the ball pretty well at times, but overall they didn't do very good. And he was put into a couple of pretty obvious passing situations. He would stare down the receiver. He would also find a way to deliver the ball with a little bit less accuracy and or velocity than he normally would. The reason being he's not stepping into his throw, not throwing through his hip. I mean, I can't stand up and give a full tutelage on quarterback play, but it's not necessary. If you don't step into a throw in baseball, basketball, football, or anything else, the velocity goes down. When you do that against long and athletic corners, you struggle. <coughs> Excuse me. You have to find a way to make him do that because he didn't do it just once. He did it twice. <clears throat> against South Carolina. The first one, he was determined based on what was being shown that he was going to throw a pattern to the right. It was the short side of the field. He didn't take his eyes off the guy. Throws the football. It was pretty accurate. But what his receiver saw, so did the DB. The eyes. When you stare at something for long enough, it's obvious in any walk of life, okay, that person over there is interested in whatever that is. They're going to jump the route. It was tailor-made interception and a good play by the South Carolina corner. But anybody could have read that. A high school junior that just first came into the lineup for the first time could have read that. Second interception. Right before half, and this was game-defining, worst play probably of Holt Naylor's career against South Carolina. And again, I use South Carolina because they got dudes. I don't care what he did against Tulane. He had a really good game, but they can't pressure the quarterback. They're not very good. South Carolina's got some dudes that will get paid. Aylers drops the pass. They're give or take uh, their own 40, something like that. And it's a screen. It's a middle screen. There's a little more confusion with those because it's not out to the flat where there's nothing but grass. That's just the risk of the coordinator and the coaches in general, handing that over to the quarterback. But he gets a little bit of pressure, and you're going to on a screen. I mean, it's a screen. You're letting guys go through. Ehlers throws a, this terrible pass. It's picked off by the linebacker, returns 63 yards for a touchdown. Pick sixes are never good, but considering the following, two really key points about that. Right before half, you're up 14 to nothing. You've got a chance to kick a field goal and make it a three-score game. The most important number in football is 17 because that signifies you're up by three scores. Two scores cannot tie the game. If you get to 17 to nothing, it is going to be really low percentage chance South Carolina can do anything. And their offense had sputtered all day. Just don't turn it over, right? He threw it right to the freaking linebacker. Terrible play. He cannot handle pressure. He'd been hit a few times, and for whatever reason, he didn't do a good job on that particular play. UCF now, when you think about that, just forget the stats and, you know, his 48% against South Carolina, they've got good players and UCF's defense is not on South Carolina's level. We, we can sit here and argue about it, but I'm telling you now it's not. They don't have Jordan Birch coming off the edge. He will be a first round draft pick. Uh, 6'6", 270 guys like him are very, very rare. That being stated, UCF does have enough talent in their front seven to make some serious havoc. They just have to find a way to get Kalia at least consistently moving the pocket and not constantly being double teamed. That's that's the number one goal. Number two, and that, that's against anybody. Number two, when they pass rush, yeah, you can take an underneath route if the tackle oversets or whatever and, and take your chances. But overall, if you keep him in the pocket, he gets happy feet and he looks down. When quarterbacks look down, quarterback coaches get angry. I mean, a lot of F-bomb angries because the play is pretty much over. But that's exactly what he does. He is textbook awful when he feels pressure. When he has a clean pocket, however, Holt Naylor's is very good. He will pick you apart. He's very accurate, has a nice soft touch. 
He can throw on the run some. He's not a great athlete. He's a guy who make one move and throw it away or get sacked. He's not going to jitterbug you. He's not like Malik Cunningham from Louisville, for instance, or the quarterback from Navy who can run the option. But a solid athlete. He gets pressured, let's say, by Big Cat, and he escapes out the other side, and that side doesn't do a good job of contain. He'll roll out and throw for 15 yards. He's cool with it. That's the one kind of weird exception about him. If he gets pressured just by the side, he's okay. Coming right at him where he feels pressure from both, trouble. So that's the first point I wanted to make about this game. You have to be able to get to him, and you have to be able to get to him on the edges. Keep him in the pocket. That is the goal number one for UCF because that style also will work with the other point that I've already talked about a little bit this week, and I'm not going to go into it here on the podcast, but Keaton Mitchell, the running back, is their guy. If you're protecting the edges well, it also helps against the run. He's okay running between the tackles, but once he gets about two, three yards outside the tackle box, you can make the argument he's the most dangerous player in all of college football, regardless of level. He has that kind of speed. UCF jacks around with him as well as Ehlers. They'll score 35 or more. Easy. Because they will hit vertical plays, meaning long runs, as well as getting the ball to a couple of pretty good receivers. One of them is only about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, Sneed, Tower Sneed. He's, he is quick, man. Really good route runner, and he finds the zone uh, or finds the hole in the zone. And that's, that's Ehlers' guy. He's got 22 catches through five games. Good football player. Just not very big. The point is, if you can keep the edges contained in a way, really in a lot of sense, similarities to what they failed to do against Louisville, UCF against Navy, you can throw that out. The options once a year. It's very unusual. The Louisville game is better, but he's not near the athlete that Cunningham is. He's not going to just run 30, 40 yards consistently. Cunningham can do that on any play. If you do that, you have an opportunity to frustrate him early, cause turnovers, and then once they get behind, key, you, you need to play ahead against East Carolina, dictate to their play calling, because when they're balanced, they're a pain. And then once you're ahead, you have an opportunity to do whatever you want defensively, whether it's blitz, play cover three, keep everything in front, mix it up, carte blanche. UCF messes around, though, and they get down like they did, let's say, the Boise game. This offense is better than the Boise offense. I can assure you of that. They relied on a certain receiver. Number two was their guy. When he was in and out of the lineup, they're a totally different team. If he hadn't come back into the lineup, they wouldn't have even made it a game in the fourth quarter. That dude's really special. Keaton can do that as well. Keaton Mitchell, the running back for them, can get outside as well as Ehlers moving the pocket. On to point two, their defense is weird in one regard. Some of the stats are, are just bizarre. They create turnovers. I, I will give them that. They strip the ball well. They're well coached in that regard, and they do a very good job of picking the ball off if it's there. A lot of DBs, well, they play DB because they don't catch well. East Carolina's DBs have made some plays. Jaquan McMillan in particular, he leads NCAA in picks. I don't throw his way unless necessary. Sands one thing. He struggles over the top. He's not a huge guy. He's 5'10", 160. Had a few problems against some of the guys from South Carolina. That'll be an interesting matchup. Brandon might, you know, he's a 6'2 guy and he's real long arms. I bet his wingspan's a 6'5", 6'6 guy anyway. I would imagine they're going to struggle. And that, that brings up this. Just looking at raw numbers, here are the points per game. East Carolina just dropped 52 in the last game, so keep this in mind. 32.2 points per game for them. The defense and the team overall now, he threw the pick six against South Carolina, 29.6. They've got a lot of talent, and yet they're winning by three points on average. So that tells me they're up and down. They have moments where they just collapse. The interception for a touchdown against South Carolina being a prime point to that, as well as something I didn't know until I watched the film. McMillan struggles with deep passes. Mikey Keene likes to do that. He just has to really pick the moment. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, that's possible. But if he's going to be throwing against cover two and whatnot, he better make a really accurate throw on a corner ball, on a crossing route, you know, dig, and the guy's going to sit down in the middle of the field. Whatever it is, they better be 100% on the money because of the following. 
against South Carolina, and their quarterback's not very good, which is typical of South Carolina. The middle of the defense pulled the ball out a few times. Interception, uh, et cetera. They don't miss opportunities. While it's common anyway, quarterback coaches and offense coordinators prefer to throw towards the outside because there's just fewer bodies, simple math. Against East Carolina, that is doubly so. You can avoid McMillan to a certain degree or just throw screens to his side or bombs. Those 10 to 15, 18-yard routes in his area, eh, maybe not the greatest idea. He can put his foot in the ground and drive on the ball very well. They have some other guys that are good too. But here's the second point in, in my bigger concern. While McMillan is obvious, and you'll know where he's at all the time if you do any research at all about them, the linebackers for East Carolina are very experienced. They know they're going against a player that's making his second career start. They're going to play games with him like nobody's business, even without, even without the East Carolina coach is saying anything to him. Going up to the line of scrimmage, backing up, changing where they're going to be at pre-snap. They might have a Will linebacker, the weak side guy, come up on the edge, the defensive end, ready to go. I'm going to blitz, drop into the zone. Vice for next play, do the same thing. He goes to defensive end. They're going to try to make Mikey Keene's head spin. So just from a numbers perspective, barring a guy just being wide open, busted coverage, whatever, in the middle of the field, I am dubbing it the dead zone. The linebackers are going to create some problems for him, and I know he's smart, I know he's advanced, and I'm very high on him, higher than most even. That is the dead zone. The safeties play very well. They're coming down there very aggressive with passes in that 10 to 15-yard range, trying to pick them off. The linebackers are a savvy group. I don't, you know, maybe it's Miles Berry. That's their middle linebacker. It, there's three or four guys that can do it for them. Just say linebackers. They're all junior seniors. They're going to play some games with him, and that could be a critical moment. Like that interception that Holt Naylor's had on the screen against South Carolina, do not allow that to be the same thing that goes against you. Make sure that you find a way to throw it away or even, you know, I don't like saying this very often, take the sack. Do not throw it to them. It should be a good game. This is the definition of a game that can be a one-play game. One-play game. Make the smart decision. UCF has to do that with any team they play, but especially you're on a two-game losing streak. You've lost two heartbreak, not just like you got beat. We're kind of close. I mean, these are down to the last play. Emotions are high. If you lose this game, man, this season can go in the toilet. It's just true. Yeah, and the injury bug and everything, UCF schedule. Next week they got Cincinnati on the road, etc. There's no reason to believe you should find a way to just – be gutsy all the time. It's okay to punt. Punt, extra points, and field goals are good. Interceptions, fumbles, and just stupidity in general are not. Throw the ball away. With that, I do expect them to challenge McMillan and anybody else on some deep routes fairly early. Just gut feel. They didn't get the ball down the field against Navy. They played super conservative in the back end with three, three guys deep. They don't have a ton of speed, so they just started out farther back. Hey, take the five-yard route. The UCF would shoot itself in the foot with a penalty or a missed block or, or just running back not getting the most he could out of the play. Just little things. And it's the difference between scoring 30 and 50 in that game was razor thin. But that's the difference between winning and losing. It's about execution, as coaches like to say. It's true. With that, here's the other really interesting stat and why you need to hem them in early. This is maybe the most bizarre stat of the year because they have some pretty good playmakers on their defense, talking about East Carolina. The Pirates have rushed for 828 yards in five games. Okay, pretty good. But they have Keaton Mitchell, who is a rocket ship, coming around the corner. He's like Johnny Richardson, maybe even faster. He has 574 yards rushing for them. Their backup running back, Pretty good player, but I don't – what's his name? Uh, Rajay Harris. Pretty good player, more power, but he's not 
not averaging very much per carry. And quite frankly, he doesn't scare me. He doesn't play his football on the edges. In the middle, especially if Tatum Bethune is back, hoping the rotation at linebacker, that's important. Very good football player. UCF should be able to do some things there. In addition to that, just I ran into this by, by accident, full disclosure. They have given up 794 rushing yards. And they basically stopped South Carolina, which I know I've mentioned at some point earlier. But they can be run on. If you can run the football a little bit from them and you can make Aylers, that's another way to make him feel uncomfortable. It's really important to do so because he makes mental errors when he doesn't feel comfy. He's got a small comfort zone around the pocket. I've talked about that ad, ad nauseum, but you get them behind. I have a feeling he's just going to throw a couple dumb passes. South Carolina, after he threw that pass for the interception, they score a grand total of three points the rest of that game. He laid an egg flat out. Now South Carolina's defense is good. Need to say that again. But Aylers laid an egg. Run the football, keep the ball away from him, make him frustrated, just standing on the sidelines where he can't do anything. That's that's the big thing. And then once you get the, get the lead or whatever, pound on it some more, he will eventually crack. That's another way to kind of get to him. So the run defense isn't very good. It is time for Johnny Richardson to hit a big play. Anyhow. Let's see what happens with that. Segment three here in just a sec. There's something else that's really kind of interesting. I, I don't know how you do this because it just seems to go in spurts, but turnovers I, I talked about a minute ago, the Knights are even on the year. East Carolina's positive five. I don't think there's any way that you're just going to shift that, especially with the freshman quarterback, but they're getting some guys back. They have to be able to create a turnover or two. They need the bounce house to be loud, sack the quarterback, all those things. They're obvious. Don't blow it up on special teams. Don't, don't put us in a hole there. These are the obvious, but they need something else in this game, some kind of special play or whatever. And just kind of going through my notes, there's a million ways you could look at it. Staying out of the middle of the field is part of it for you. You certainly don't want to provide them with an opportunity. But which player or players for UCF, especially in the back seven, the true linebackers, safeties, corners, makes a play or hopefully more than one play that causes the offensive coordinator for East Carolina to give a great deal of pause about, hey, we may not want to do that again. I know for a fact that the UCF players on defense respect their quarterback because they think he's pretty good in terms of accuracy. He can spin it, and it's true. With that being stated, they also know that if you hit that kid in the mouth, he's not the same player. That I know too. Which guy comes up with it? As I mentioned a few minutes ago, most DBs play defensive back because they don't catch well, but they're a heck of a heck of an athlete. When that pass comes across the middle or it's deflected in the air, Big Cat tips it or Kalia tips it, whatever happens, the player or players that have an opportunity to pick that off and score need to do so. That electric moment that's went against UCF multiple times this year, let's flip, let's flip that around. It's UCF's time to have that play. When's it going to happen? UCF needs one of those. Pass rush, hit the quarterback, fumble, scoop, score. Jump an out route, take it down the sign lines, six points. UCF needs that play. And it needs to happen in a manner that is natural. Not talking about just something that was just God-given because the other team just completely laid an egg. Quarterback feels pressure, throws it up. You have to take advantage. Those two or three times you have a chance at a pick, can't drop them. Can't drop them. Devontae's been playing better. He's my pick for that to happen. No pun intended. Devontae Brown played a little bit better this past week. 
and I think he's growing as a football player. He's only a sophomore, so it's he's been thrust into the situation probably a little earlier than he would like. That being said, it, it's part of the game of football. You have to do certain things at an earlier stage sometimes, but it is what it is. Which guy is it for UCF that does it? And it, to a certain degree, it could also be in reverse as well from last week, a punt block. It could be a situation where, for whatever reason, UCF hasn't been in field goal situations very much this year. Just making the great kick at the end of the half. You get uh, 45 seconds before half. You're at midfield. You go 30 yards. You get it down to the 20, and you kick a field goal. You just do everything right. Just execution. Because at the end of the last game, or end of the first half at the last game, it went the other way. Just something like that where it's a mental energy for the Knights. I'm not sure if there's really one way to do it because they just need something in that variety to happen. But I'm, I'm also sure of one other thing. If UCF doesn't get something like that to happen in this game or that's that extra energy boost, East Carolina has enough offense, even though their defense is suspect in some ways. They create big plays but give up a lot of them. You don't want to be in a close game in the late stages of the fourth quarter. Two games in a row, it's not went well. You don't want the here we go again situation to creep into their minds. It's just human nature for UCF fans, too. I know fans are frustrated, and I get it. It's hard to lose like that once, let alone two games in a row. But you have to also kind of look at it from this perspective. Football is an odd thing. It goes in some weird ebbs and flows. And I don't know how many times I've looked at a game and said, man, there's no way this team's going to win a big play like that on a punt block, pick six, a scoop and score. And all of a sudden, it's just an avalanche. It's just boom. Will they do that and make the most of their situation? I'm really not sure, but they they have a chance, I would think. Uh, there's no reason to believe that they're not going to be good enough to come up with one of those plays. And it could be something that helps you for more than one game. This doesn't have to be just a one moment kind of deal because sometimes a team will grab a moment where, hey, we made it happen. And then consistency. They expect it. They believe it. The coaching matters more. Which player is it for the Knights that does that? That's probably about as simple as it, it can get in terms of theory, but you just don't know when the opportunity is going to be there, and you have to rise to the occasion. Um, just as an example, Justin Hodges played this past week at corner. He's a kid, another long, lanky kid. He played pretty well at times against Navy, but – he also struggled at times because of the cut blocks and whatnot. It's different playing against him. But for the most part, he rose to the occasion what he did. It wasn't like he was going to get a bunch of picks against Navy, but he took on his challenge. He did his aspect of the job. He doesn't have to be the one to make the, the critical interception, but if the guy he's covering is covered, no chance to throw it, quarterback moves on. If everybody's covered, the quarterback might get hit and drop the ball. It's just about making the play for you. And you may not even be mentioned. Oftentimes it's best for DBs not to be mentioned. That matters the most. Do the Knights find a way to come up with that play? It could be Hodges or anybody else. Again, my pick was Devontae. I think he's starting to turn the corner to a certain degree. Just his body language and whatnot. He has a chance. Will they find a way? If they do, they can win this game. If not, East Carolina's got plenty of talent, and they have plenty of opportunity to make it happen. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap it up on that, but just think about it. Which player or players is the one to get UCF over the top? But just to kind of recap a couple of things, Mikey Keene needs to stay out of the middle of the field. They have experienced linebackers. Safeties are aggressive. They can get turnovers. Uh, they're a star corner. Jaquan McMillan, good player, but not very big. You can beat him over the top. That's proven. Their rush defense stinks. UCF has to run the ball. And then most importantly is something that I've talked about the last two weeks and UCF failed to do. 
protect the edges on defense. Holt Naylor stinks when he gets pressured and he has to move up in the pocket. He does not like to be hit. Not that anybody does, but then he also makes critical errors and throws it to the wrong team. Two, their running back is Keaton Mitchell, and he is electric. Pretty good runner, tough runner between the tackles, but he is electric outside. He's 180 pounds, give or take, and his speed is what makes him a great football player. He averaged around three yards a carry against South Carolina. Every other game, this is this is no bull here. In their other four games, he's averaged 9.6 yards a carry or more. He is electric. And I know their competition hasn't been great, including Charleston Southern. They stink. Doesn't matter. If you average over nine yards a pop against somebody, I need to take note. UCF hems him in, makes him run between the tackles, and he averages four or five yards a carry. You're in the ball game. If he's averaging nine, you're not going to beat East Carolina. Then Awards can also run play action, just quick fake, and then just throw. Very accurate quarterback. Cannot happen. So that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Daily Night. Um, I just want to say that this is going to be a very interesting game as the last comment. So everybody have a great day and enjoy it all the way around.